somebody I'm really excited to talk with because we're going to be talking about nutrition. We've got none other than the infamous Dr. Michael Greger. How are you doing today, Doc? I am doing fantastic. I'm so excited to be here and help inspire your listeners to live longer, better lives. Well, nobody knows it better than you. Look, you've written a bunch of books. Look, How Not to Die, How Not to Die Cookbook, How Not to Diet, uh, how, how to Survive a Pandemic. And the latest one is How Not to Age, which is just coming out. Amazing book. Um, so right off the bat, I want to say in, chapter, in, in one of the chapters, you cover um, people over 100 years old, centenarians. I'm, do I, I'm getting them confused with centaurs, which is this half man, half beast kind of thing. But That's, can, though you could be a centenarian centaur. That is not uh, mutually exclusive. <laughs> I hear they live longer because of their plant-based diets. Um, oh, there you go. There you go. So can, can you give Good us- for hoof health. <laughs> <laughs> Can you t give us a little insight as to what centenarians eat? What are these old old folks are eating? Yeah, so based on uh, more than 100 surveys in the so-called blue zones, dietary surveys, blue zones are the uh, areas around the world where people live the longest, healthiest lives. Um, they center their diets around whole plant foods. So they're minimizing processed foods, meat, dairy, eggs, sugar, salt, while maximizing fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, nuts and seeds, mushrooms, herbs and spices, basically real food that grows out of the ground. These are our healthiest choices. Good to know. I'm glad that I did the switch and I went on my plant-based diet because I also feel better. I feel like I'm getting oh, younger great. even, dare I say. Um, well, the other thing is, look, I, I actually really love uh, coffee, and I think the world runs on coffee, and there's a lot of, you know, misinformation. Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, what is your consensus on coffee and sort of aging and stuff like that? Yeah, in my chapters on uh, liver disease, depression, and Parkinson's, in my book, How Not to Die, I discuss the benefits of coffee for the liver, mind, and brain. Coffee drinkers do seem to live longer lives than non-coffee drinkers and have lower cancer rates overall. Um, at the same time, uh, coffee can worsen acid reflux disease, bone loss, and glaucoma. Otherwise, though, coffee is good for you, though every cup of coffee is a lost opportunity to drink something even healthier, a cup of green tea. Ah, green tea. Now, I do drink the green tea. Well, what about something like Postum or uh, aka cereal coffee? Have you have you checked out this at all? Oh, you know, that's a great question. I looked and I could not find any good data on people, you know, eating this kind of like, uh, you know, like the toasted barley kind of stuff. So I do not know. So there's just really no data either way. Interesting. Okay. And and as far as decaf goes, uh, what's the difference between decaf and regular? Oh, uh, you get the same benefits in terms of longevity. Um, so it's not the caffeine. Uh, it's probably uh, the what's called the chlorogenic acid, um, which is the principal antioxidant in coffee beans, which boosts autophagy, which is this kind of house cleaning process within our bodies to kind of clean up old um, kind of misshapen proteins in our body that accumulate with age. Um, but the chlorogenic acid level contents vary as much as 30-fold between different coffees. Most of that range is because of Starbucks because they oh they roast their beans so dark that they destroy most of the antioxidant content um and so i would encourage people to uh um uh, the the healthiest coffees would be um paper filtered um brewed coffee um uh, has more chlorogenic acid than espresso um uh freeze-dried instant is fine but the um the the paper filter um, uh, trap some of the cholesterol raising compounds in coffee, which uh, um, which is why you get even a greater longevity benefit from paper filled brood versus just coffee in general. Now you said something about caffeine, caffeinated coffee, uh, kind of canceling out some of the arterial benefits. Oh yeah, so um, in the short term acute studies. Um, uh, you you see this. Uh, you can see a diminishment in even uh, blood flow in the brain uh, mm -hmm. by eating caffeinated drinks. But in terms of what, how, what, how does that translate into long-term effects? When you look at large observational studies, and now there's been done with literally 30 million people um, over decades. Um, those drinking coffee, caffeinated or not, 
do tend to um, live longer lives. And so whatever kind of short-term acute effects uh, caffeine can have on brain arteries do not seem to uh, impair health in the long term. Interesting. You, I think you said 12%. 12% of the people who drink coffee are likely to not die of any cause, right? Which is a very interesting thing. But uh, is this just because of your alertness that co coffee, you, you're more or less likely to have an accident <laughs> or something? Just, I don't know. Right. Yeah. All cause, yeah. Decrease in all cause mortality, which is to say, um, added up all, you know, in terms of that's the kind of synonymous with the decrease your risk of premature death. But in turn, no, no, but co coffee, caffeine in general um, does indeed save lives on the road. You want your truck drivers um, who are often being paid to get there uh, quicker. They paid more if they get there quicker. Um, uh, we do want them as caffeinated as possible to not uh, kill people on the road. <laughs> Stay alert, trucker capsules all night. Yeah. Um, so, and also, I had to I had to point this out in the book. It's it's you say coffee enemas. We should steer clear of coffee enemas, citing the physicians say things like rectal burns. And my my question is, well, wouldn't you want to let the coffee cool down before you? Went you ahead? would think. <laughs> you would think. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so right. No, but it's not just rectal burns. You can have electrolyte abnormalities, all sorts of things, perforation. Yeah, I encourage people to uh, drink their coffee from the uh, top down rather than the bottom up. <laughs> and you also recently said cola as well is not a good in any orifice. It doesn't matter what study they do if you put cola in Well, any... I mean, they, they have not tested all the orifices to be... <laughs> to be completely fair, but of the orifice tested so far, cola should be uh, off the table. Okay, good to know. I'm glad I already knew that. I didn't have to go and make my own little science experiment. Um, so also, you know, th there are s science problems with like, I just read this study about coffee and it was done. It said, well, coffee make you live forever, but it was done by the Italian Coffee Association. So you, you do have to look out for these sort of conflicts of interest, right? Absolutely. In fact, that's the first thing I do when I look at a study is who funded it. Because mm -hmm. um, you're concerned about the so-called funding bias or sponsorship bias. Now, that doesn't mean the study is necessarily bad, but it's certainly you take it with a grain of salt and you want to make sure that the study was not designed to have a kind of predetermined outcome, as so often happens um, in the scientific literature. Yeah. Well, if it's harmful, but if it's money making, hey, we might have to, you know, fudge the numbers a bit. Um, everyone, everybody loves sleep. I do, especially some more than others. What is the consensus on sleep and aging? Yeah, you know, it's surprisingly controversial, actually. Um, for adults old, 65 and older, we're looking for seven or eight hours of night of sleep. It's recommended, um, though the relationship with uh, longevity is actually uncertain. Uh, we do know that insomnia risk um, increases as we get old. Sleeping pills like Ambien are absolute non-starter associated with significantly higher risk of premature death. Um, uh, the recommended treatment for insomnia is a combination of optimal sleep hygiene and conditioning. Um, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, your sleep environment, um, also warm showers, foot baths um, um, uh, before bedtime, warm socks at night can help sleep. Um, I don't recommend melatonin uh, uh, supplements because of uh, concerns about contamination, but there are melatonin rich foods like kiwi fruit and tart cherries um, that may help. Um, uh, and so, well, yeah, no, sleep is important, although it's... Uh, its uh, contribution to longevity is controversial. Interesting. Okay, I did not know that. Um, and you've also mentioned things like, I heard you talk about lettuce extract that's just been around since Roman times. or, or Oh, things. yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I think it's like a teaspoon of lettuce seeds, right? Yeah. Was that what the study? I yeah, randomized so. per versus placebo. Significant improvement in sleep because of this compound, um, uh, lactucin. Oh, it's all coming back to me now. Thank you for the prompt. Well, I like to yeah, bring, no. bring Dr. Greg Ron and put him to the test.
Yeah, exactly, exactly. I know I so often look. I'm going to nutritionfacts.org to find out. <laughs> like, what? I know there's a study, something. I'm looking at my own stuff. Yeah. Just because it's so mad. Look, this last book, thirteen thousand citations. I mean, come on. It's just I gotta. Yeah. I, so I gotta go to the index, be looking it up myself. Your your head would be three times as big if it wasn't for computers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's I, 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 I mean, I love learning this stuff, but you know. Just yeah, <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to keep it all in there. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, so here's a personal question. Look, I I'm getting older and I feel it. I notice inflammation. Uh, it's not very much fun. How can I minimize some in inflammation and stuff through diet? Yeah, you know, aging can be thought of as an inflammatory disease. Um, a single measurement of inflammatory markers like IL-6 or, uh, or C-reactive protein can predict physical and cognitive performance as well as remaining lifespan in elderly individuals. Um, uh, in a, there was a study of thousands of individuals followed over time, over a third of which, um, uh, about a third of those with uh, age-related diseases started out with CRP. Over 10 were alive uh, five years later, whereas those with a nice low inflammatory index below three, about a third, um, uh, only about a third were dead within the same time frame. But thankfully, no problem. Excess inflammation can be extinguished through changes in diet. Mm. Um, and uh, how we do that is we lower on the dietary inflammatory index. Um, and that's just, uh, they just scored foods for what, um, uh, what effect eating different foods has on um, inflammatory mediators. And uh, those eating um, more anti-inflammatory diets are more likely to age successfully, um, uh, have good um, uh, and, and better lifespan, better health span. Um, and so uh, this involves uh, reducing our intake of uh, inflammatory advanced glycation end products, these so-called gerontotoxins formed by high heat, dry cooking of meat predominantly. So if we are going to eat meat, we want stewed, um, uh, you know, boiled, um, uh, steamed. Um, uh, that's the way we should uh, cook meat. So prevent these production of these pro-inflammatory agents. Um, uh, also saturated fat, uh, sodium is pro-inflammatory. Tropical oils like uh, found a lot of processed foods like coconut oil, palm kernel oil, mm. um, uh, increase one's. Uh, um, inflammation. And then the anti-inflammatory foods are the legumes, the berries, the greens, um, um, uh, uh, salt-free tomato products like uh, salt-free tomato juice or tomato paste, oats, flax seeds, turmeric has been found to be anti-inflammatory, ginger, garlic, cinnamon, cocoa powder, dill, um, green tea, chamomile tea, both anti-inflammatory, and other kind of high-fiber foods anthocyanin or kind of blue black foods mm -hmm. blue black purple pigmented foods like berries and red cabbage um also anti-inflammatory as well and so um we have a large leeway over inflammatory and processes in the body um uh, as well as reducing excess body fat because that deep visceral belly fat in people who are overweight also spew out inflammatory media so just by losing weight you can decrease inflammation in your body wow Wow. Yeah. And, and, and also you, apparently, according to you, there's, uh, if you have arthritis, olive oil, not ingested, but on the outside topically can actually help with arthritis. Is that... Topical extra virgin olive oil and sesame oil both um, have anti-inflammatory effects and actually help with the primary cause of disabil uh, disability in older men and women, which is knee osteoarthritis. Um, if those don't work, you can move up to topical NSAIDs, these uh, non-inflammatory, these, uh, these, these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, not to be taken by mouth, but topically tend to be much safer. But yeah, try the oils first. Um, and there's some foods that uh, also found to have uh, benefits for osteoarthritis, including uh, strawberries. Um, what, was, what were some of the other foods? That, strawberries uh, was a big one. I remember that. Uh, so was, I remember strawberries. Oh, rose hips, ginger, turmeric, um, and then the topical sesame or extra virgin olive oil yeah. um, to the joints, as well as weight loss if you're overweight. 
um, can take some stress off the joints. And, and I just got on to, turned on to the black cumin thing. Can, can you just shortly say oh. the, the magic of black cumin for everybody? Very, very cool. No, yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is something that I, you know, one of the things that I've incorporated into my personal diet that I didn't know about before this research, because the booster of uh, AMPK, which is uh, kind of an anti-aging enzyme within the body, can be boosted through vinegar, the consumption of acetic acid, or through black cumin, just a quarter teaspoon a day. Black cumin kind of has kind of a peppery kind of flavor. Um, and so uh, you can just put black cumin seeds in a pepper grinder along with your black, black peppercorns and grind it on things. It does not take much. It has a variety of benefits, including decreasing cholesterol and helping with blood sugar control, etc. But the reason we want it for longevity is the boosting of AMPK, which is kind of an energy sensor, which is one of the reasons why caloric restriction extends life. But instead of walking around hungry all the time, um, you can uh, you can mimic some of those effects with compounds like black cumin. Oh yeah, I, I find it to be pretty delicious. Put it in a baguette. Oh, and of course, great. ground is better than the seed. So if you get the ground, is that yeah, right? yeah, you got to grind it up. Otherwise, it just kind of passes through. It doesn't do much. It doesn't do you any good. Many foods like same that. thing with flax seeds. Same thing with flax seeds. You want to grind our flax seeds up? Ah, good to know. Le always learning. Um, what about maintaining foods that would help maintain somebody's blood sugar if they had like kind of a hyperglycemic uh, or kind of, you know, wild swinging blood sugar? Are there any foods that could help kind of stabilize that? Well, so the most important thing we need to do is, um, uh, is decrease insulin resistance. And so normally we should have normal blood sugars um, uh, um, thanks to a hormone in our body called insulin, which lowers our blood sugars. However, our, our tissues can become resistant to the effects of insulin. And then we can get these huge, every time we eat, we can get these huge blood sugar spikes. Um, how do we decrease insulin resistance, improve insulin sensitivity? We do that by decreasing our intake of saturated fat and excess calories. Those are the kind of the two things. Um, by lowering those two, we can improve our insulin sensitivity. And then um, eat, uh, um, and then, um, all that, so that's improving the insulin sensitivity. And then we want to avoid the really high glycemic foods, which are these refined carbohydrates like, uh, breakfast cereals, um, uh, and, you know, uh, white rice, white potatoes, that kind of thing. We really want to, um, move towards less processed. So instead of instant oats, um, uh, steel cut is best or oat groats, which is the pre-cut steel cut oats. Um, uh, as a way of slowing the absorption of carbohydrates into our system. Now, the glycemic index is this marker, and it turns out that onions are somehow like higher than apples, and carrots are higher than apples, or something like this. It's so it's, right. right. Uh, what's what am I missing here? As no, as it's as only the, right. No, no. So that because so what you need to look at is glycemic load, um, which is glycemic index taking into account how many carbohydrates in the food. And so yes, yeah, so carrots, for example a very high glycemic index, but they have a low glycemic load. Okay. Glycemic index says if you take 100 grams of the carbohydrate of this food, how does that compare to 100 grams of carbohydrate in another food? And you say, okay, that seems like a fair comparison until you realize how many carbohydrates are in different foods. And so, yes, if you were able to eat like a wheelbarrow full of carrots, um, you, but you couldn't eat as many carrots as this test would require. And so you need, a, a, you need to have a measure of not only how much the carbohydrates spike your bloodstream, but how many carbohydrates in the food, that's where you get glycemic load from. So we want to eat low glycemic load foods. And we can do that by eating just, you know, whole healthy natural foods, fruits and vegetables have low glycemic loads. It's really with the um, kind of refined carbs, white bread kind of thing, where you can get your uh, blood, blood sugars too high. And if you're touching sweeteners or kind of any kind of high fructose corn syrup, you're doing it all wrong anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the amount counts, but yeah, we really should try to minimize our intake of, of added sugars. Um, uh, yeah, if you want something sweet, sweet potatoes, fresh fruit, that's really the way to go. Yeah, there you go. Right from a doctor's mouth, people. You got to <laughs> take it easy on the sugar. Um, so in the world gone crazy, you know, stress is everywhere. Everybody's going kind of nuts. Uh, what is the relationship to stress and aging and, and, and how do we manage it? Uh, you know, stress, um, uh, increased stress is, uh, cuts our lifespan short through indirectly 
um, through lifestyle behaviors that increase mortality. It's not the stress that itself independently shortens lifespan. It's the fact that people who are bereaved or stressed in other ways start smoking, start eating so-called comfort foods, um, uh, you know, start uh, uh, treating themselves poorly. And that is what leads to the increased um, mortality. Um, when we're stressed, we not only eat more, but we tend to eat sugar, sugar, more sugary foods and fatty foods and high caloric foods um, and, you know, increased substance use like alcohol, tobacco, illicit drugs. And so it's really that is the mechanism by which stress um, leads to these uh, bad outcomes. But if you actually control for those outcomes, you don't see um, um, uh, uh, increased mortality with stress. And I think, uh, you know, I talk about this kind of natural experiment that was set up uh, the, during the wartime deprivation of World War II where uh, countries under Nazi occupation um, uh, who uh, were, had their food rationed and livestock were slaughtered off and had to live off of, you know, uh, you know garden vegetables and the grains that used to be fed to the animals. Uh, you'd think, uh, you, you can't imagine a more stressful situation than being under Nazi occupation. So heart disease rates shot up, right? No, they plummeted. Heart, uh, heart disease rates, diabetes rates, Everybody got way healthier because all of a sudden they were eating healthier foods until they were liberated, and then they could go back to eating their butter and all the, and then all you know, all you know, everything got worse. So but it just gives you a sense of the subordinate, um, uh, uh, you know, priority that stress has compared to something like diet and lifestyle, which we have ultimate control over. Yeah. Uh, how much of the illness, chronic illness, do you think is preventable just with diet and lifestyle alone? How much of it's brought It comes on? out to be about 80%. So 80% of chronic lifestyle diseases, um, about 80% um, preventable, a little more. So it's really more like 90% when it comes to um, um, uh, something like heart disease, and it's less when it comes to stroke, but it all averages out to be about 80% is a good round is a good kind of average figure. How do we fit in the Western, in the, as far as the Western world versus the, the global world? Are we worse off than other people, uh, you know, in a metabolic? Oh, yeah, no, we're, um, our life expectancy is about, down to about 39th um, uh, in terms of uh, countries in the world. Um, so people in Slovenia, for example, live longer than Americans. Um, and uh, part of it's the obesity epidemic. Um, part of it is our healthcare system, standard American diet. Unfortunately, now though, we are exporting our diet. We are this kind of Kentucky Fried Chickenization of the rest of the world, and so then everyone can have the same, you know, American diseases that we have. Um, and so, a place like you know Okinawa, Japan, which used to have the second longest living population in the world, now has more KFCs than anywhere else, and they have actually the most obese prefect of all of Japan. And uh, so there's a big push to eat the Okinawan diet in Okinawa as well now. Um, uh, yeah, so it's and, really unfortunate. And they traditionally have had very good uh, longevity rates and also, uh, you know, clean colons and everything like that. But you you said that there was something about stomach cancer, a, a weird anomaly of oh, stomach oh, no, cancer no, no, in yeah, Japan. Yeah. So Japan and in Korea have some of the highest stomach, stomach cancer rates in the world, and it's because they're eating exceedingly high salt food. So salt doesn't just increase blood pressure, um, but increases stomach cancer risk. So they eat these fermented, highly salted vegetables and fish um, that you can actually do experiments where you do biopsies. I um, mean, literally within a few days, you can see the kind of inflammation that would lead to the precancerous changes that end up um, causing stomach cancer. So yes, you know, Japan still has, you know, much lower breast cancer rates and prostate cancer rates, but higher stomach cancer rates. When they moved to the U.S., their breast and prostate cancer rates shoot up, but their stomach cancer rates drop because they're eating some of these less, uh, the, the, eating less of these traditional highly salted foods. Interesting. Uh, I know from uh, a neighbor who lived in Japan, they say they call everybody in the West, Germans and Americans alike, they call us butter stinkers. <laughs> Well, they, you know, it's interesting uh, reading the, the Japanese medical literature. They have all sorts of, um, they have like 30 different terms for like gastrointestinal distress. It's not just like my tummy hurts. No, they have 30 different ways to describe your tummy hurts. And they have all these different names for different body odors. 
that that is, so there's something called kiriashu, I believe, which is the smell of old people. <laughs> like old people get this smell, and it, actually there's these omega seven fats that are excreted on their skin and bacteria turn it. And so we actually do get a smell with old age, but leave it to the Japanese to yeah. actually come up with a word for it. They're very expressive yeah. when it comes to bodily states. Yeah, I would say that there are a medley or a spectrum of, you know, human odors that we could say, well, that's oh, a little sure. bit like a gyro today or... <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, but not to be too gross. Um, but okay, so my last question is kind of, it's a dark question. It, it, it revolves around... Um, like we talked about before, the minefield of misinformation that nutrition science is. Um, how, how, in your view, has our, our kind of science been hijacked by the food industry? You know, it's really, it's really sad, and that's why I kind of, I do the, I you know, do the work that I do, it's because there's so much money to be made. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 we're talking about a trillion dollar industry, the processed food industry, um, uh, you know, the, the soda companies, the fast food, I mean, with so much money at stake, they can literally, you know, uh, U.S. tobacco companies spend a million dollars an hour, um, uh, you know, advertising, um, you know, Coca-Cola's the number one biggest, uh, you know, food advertiser. And so we're just bombarded by these messages day in, day out. They provide educational materials for schools. I mean, it's just like all around we are surrounded. And it's only because it just turns out that the unhealthiest foods are the ones that make the most profit. I mean, that's why you don't see ads for sweet potatoes at the Super Bowl, because there's just no profit margin, right? Because fruits and vegetables go bad. They're perishable. It's like the worst possible thing to sell, right? You want a snack cake that lives on the, on the shelf for a few weeks. That's how you make money dirt cheap ingredients like taxpayer subsidy sugar and then you put it you make you know brown sugar water sell for a few bucks a bottle it's like all profit right and so even if the you know ceo of coca-cola was like hmm, maybe we shouldn't contribute to the childhood obesity epidemic let's start selling something healthy they'd get kicked on their asses because we have shareholders that demand the next quarterly profits how do you make money you don't make money by selling apples you make money by selling you know garbage uh, so it's just un an unfortunate that the worst foods happen to make the most money. And so it's it's not some conspiracy. It's just how the system works. And so unfortunately, these food companies don't necessarily have our family's best interests at heart. So we have to take control over our own community, our own family, and, uh, you know, educate ourselves um, to live the long healthy lives we all deserve. <laughs> well, we're trying, yeah. Um, and, and we say, I'm big plant-based. Everybody should go plant-based and, and listen to Dr. Gregory. He's just going to save lives the more people that tune in and listen to. And the, the two critics that I read on his Wikipedia, one of them is a lobbyist from a, million, a millionaire lobbyist who's in bed with Coca-Cola, Tyson, Monsanto, Cargill, et cetera, et cetera. And the other one was involved in the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. He's refused to stop. To, so the, your only two critics are like the most horrible people in the, in the history. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing good. Well, that's funny. All right, sounds good. All right, so Dr. Michael Greger, awesome. How Not to Age, anything you want to add before we go? I'm just uh, excited. Uh, please uh, encourage people to contact me if they have any questions. Um, uh, all my contact information is on the website, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to coming back on. Yeah, come back on, do it, and we're going to put you to the test. All right, take care, everybody. Bye. <laughs>